Basic Architect coming at you from our Build Show Build Boston site. Um, thought today we would talk a little bit about drift and drift in a structural sense. But before we do that, I had to go around here and look for a stick because we're going to be talking about um, the roof framing and I can't quite reach. So I grabbed this stick and it just so happens to say switch stick. So it must have been off the electrician's cart. And I just wanted to point out, if you, you know, I talked about the electrician, but this is uh, guys thinking smart and uh, not working so hard. They cut a stick to the height and then they just set all the boxes on there and nail them in. So they don't have to consistently come out and measure, they can just set it on their switch stick. So anyways, let's talk about drift. We come in here. So this is one of those games where they all may look the same, but it's not quite the same. So, what I mean is, we have a whole series of floor joists all the way through here to this one. Those on this side are all 12 inches on center. And then you notice when we go from here to there, it jumps to 16 inches on center. So you can clearly see the four inch disparity between this joist bay and this joist bay. Now, why all of a sudden did we go to that 16 inch spacing there, but over here we tightened up for about 10 feet to a 12 inch spacing? Well, part of the answer is around the corner here. You can see here we have a volume ceiling where we use trusses, but more importantly, you can see up here we actually have a vertical wall that meets the flat roof beyond. So you have the flat roof and you have a vertical wall sitting on top of it there. Now, <clears throat> that vertical wall, we would typically call it, I call it a cheek wall. There's probably a bunch of names for it, side wall, um, but I call it a cheek wall. So that cheek wall basically rises up from the edge of that flat ceiling. Now, one of the potential um, problems with that is the minute I introduce a vertical surface across or at the end of a horizontal surface, I have the ability to accumulate blown snow, right? We've all seen snow drifts if we um, live in cold climates for sure, but even if you live in Florida, you're probably familiar with what a snow drift is. Um, basically, the wind blows the snow, the snow gets carried by air until it finds some type of structural resistance, like a wall, and then it falls and settles. So on that cheek wall, we have the ability to mound the snow, right? So out here on the flat roof, if the wind blows, chances are it's going to blow the snow off of the roof. There's nothing there really to restrain it. So when we come up to that cheek wall and we have that restraint, then we're required to create a slightly stronger structural roof there. And in this case here, the structural engineer made it stronger for the first 10 feet by bringing those floor joists in another 30%, right? And moving them from the 16 inches down to the 12 inches there and moving them over four inches. So having those at 12 inches on center beef up the structural capacity of that roof for the first 10 feet so that if we get that accumulated snow on top, we're uh, well within the means to carry that drifted snow given the height of our cheek wall. Now, if the cheek wall is much higher, then maybe that number changes even more and those tighten up even more or they get replaced for an LVL. But <clears throat> the point is, is that whenever you have that wall, you've introduced a potential predicament that could become a structural requirement. So we have to react to that and we have to react to the idea of drift. So anyways, that's the concept of drift. This is Build Show Build Boston. I'm Steve Basic Architect. Until next time, long live our